Welcome to our first Topics in Music discussion. For most of the series, we will have professionals engaged in roundtable conversations about relevant topics in music. But today, we have the unique opportunity to speak with a 30-year veteran of the Broadway stage. He has performed with such legendary talents as Gregory Hines, Stephanie Mills, Phyllis Hyman, Bob Fosse, Lena Horne, Mariah Carey, Tina Turner, and I could go on for days. He is an accomplished actor, singer, and dancer with 12 Broadway shows to his credit. He has performed around the world, and we are honored to have him here today. Please help me welcome Mr. Eugene Fleming. Hello there. Hi, Mr. Fleming. How you doing? Good to have you here today. Yeah, well, thank you. It's good to be here. Great, great. Um, you began your training as a dancer. How did your parents decide to put you into dance classes? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I think as a kid, I used to do a lot of dancing and a lot of singing around the house. And uh, James Brown was out around that time, you know, and uh, I used to jump into a cold sweat and jump into splits and do all kinds of things on the floor and all of that. And one of my one of my father's friends, my father ran a barber shop. One of his barbers said, that boy going to be a star, <laughs> you know. Uh, I don't know if he knew something. He said, he's got a talent. So my mother put me in dance classes to keep me from breaking up the stuff in the house, <laughs> you know, to put it mildly. Um, that's kind of how I started dancing. Okay. Um, in Richmond, Virginia, there was a, um, there was an old guy that, that used to work with Bojangles, an old, old guy, and I had a chance to uh, take some lessons from him when I was about six or seven. and. Um, and interesting enough, that was back in like the, I guess the, the late 60s, early 70s. So that was at a time when, when uh, things were still kind of separate, you know, segregated and all that. And uh, I was in a black dancing school across town and there was a lady that owned, her name was Miss Chapman, she owned a, a white school. And uh, she put me in the others, in the black school because they wouldn't take me in the, in the white school at that time. Yeah. So it was a really interesting period, uh, but uh, that's how I started dancing. Okay, so I know that you also were involved in sports. How did you, how did you, how did you manage the two or balance the two? I always played football, basketball, and uh, uh, I like ping pong. I had a ping pong table, so I did a lot of ping pong playing too. But um, what I did was I played little league football, and I would go play football during the. Uh, evenings and then I would take dance class afterward and I kind of uh, did them both for a number of years. Oh goodness, when did you have time to do your homework? Uh, well I did, I, I, I accomplished that. That, that, <laughs> that, that, that took a minute or two but uh, I pulled that off, yeah. Okay. But uh, the dance thing was just something I really enjoyed doing um, and it worked with, with uh, I started ballet around about uh, 12 or 13 and that was like around the time uh, Dr. J came out, Dr. Julius Irving. And he used to float to the basket, you know, and, uh, and his moves looked very balletic. And uh, so, I don't know, something about that clicked in me and, and I, liked, I liked doing that, so I did it. But there wasn't a tremendous amount of backlash from your colleagues in the school about being oh, a dancer? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. The fellas used to call me Shirley Temple and Bojangles oh. and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that wasn't... That wasn't the most fun, oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, because I could um, do things with a basketball that most of them couldn't, uh, they kind of went on past that. And the coach had a good time saying, "Hey, Bubba, you try this one." That was my nickname, Bubba, at that time, as opposed to Eugene. <laughs> now, do you attribute your basketball abilities to what you were able to do on the basketball court, or were you just gifted in a di were they two different talents? When, when, you know what I I kind of I I just did it all. I, I enjoyed I enjoyed singing, I enjoyed dancing, and, and the sports was just another part of it. And at that time, I, it was like, they were separate worlds, most definitely, because I, I couldn't take uh, the, the dance stuff to the basketball court, you know what I mean? And, and um, I, I didn't even tell the fellas. The fellas found out uh, I was doing the Nutcracker when I was about 13 or 14 with the Richmond Ballet in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, I was on the front page of the Sunday Times in a jump split, and that's how they found out I was wow. dancing. <laughs> you outed yourself. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. So, so when did you know you wanted to be a professional dancer, performer, entertainer? I decided to go to North Carolina School of the Arts my senior year in high school. And uh, 
I, I didn't, I never really thought about being a professional dancer. You know, I really? just, I, I never said that this was something I wanted to do. I just liked doing it, you know, and my parents kind of uh, followed through on that and, and helping me to, to find my dream. Wow. Yeah. So you went from being a little boy who's involved in dance, right. very sort of peripherally, to being put on this um, dancing performer track at North Carolina School of the Arts. When you became an adult, what kinds of programs did you participate in that, that you think helped you? <clears throat> Interesting enough, um, I would tell everybody, you have to be well-rounded. You know, I, I was blessed to, to, to be in a nice Baptist church growing up, and so that's where I got my vocal training. You know, um, I, I didn't really, I, I didn't do the things that most folks do in school, like the Glee Club and, and, you know, the theater club and all of that. I didn't do any of those things because I was, was kind of being on the down low oh, <laughs> with, yeah. with the dance thing, right. you know. But um, once, once I figured out what it was I wanted to do, I started to take like all types of, all different types of classes. When I got one of my shows on Broadway, I took a speech class because they wanted to get rid of my accent. They thought I had a, a southern drawl. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, funny. yeah, yes, there's a, there's a lot of things that I, I would say performers or folks that want to be in the arts, they should they should try to cover themselves. You know, um, the more the more you know, uh, the better chances you you have of working. You know. Um, I think you, you, you really need to know a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this and that, you know what I mean? Be a jack of all trades as opposed to, you know, a master of none. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, um, there's one aspect of performance that I think people kind of overlook a lot of times in interviews like this, and that's the, um, the role of the people that you have around you. Can you kind of describe what an agent, a manager, publicist, what all those people do and how they contribute to your career and also how you in, you, you line yourself up with good management and agents. Now that's interesting. Um, my first show, I got it at seventeen eighteen. It was a chorus line. Um, I was in North Carolina School of the Arts and uh, the national company of a chorus line came through holding auditions. And uh, I happened to be in the lunchroom and one of the young ladies uh, came up to me and said, Gene, you have to go audition for this show, you know, because you can sing dance. You can sing dance and act, you know. And I was like, no, baby, I'm a ballet dancer. <laughs> 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 but she was an actress because uh, North Carolina School of the Arts has a theater department, you know, and all of that. But um, so I went to this audition and I didn't have the, the proper song, which was uh, they wanted you to, to come in and, and, and sing. Uh, uh, what is it? Eight bars, 16 bars of, of a song, all right? I didn't know any songs, so I sang Happy Birthday. The guy had me sing Happy Birthday, which was really rather funny. And then I ended up singing, The sun will come out tomorrow, bet your And I didn't sing it like Annie, but you know, right. it worked. And <laughs> but but uh, from there, um, I graduated high school at North Carolina School of the Arts. That summer, I went to Juilliard. I got a scholarship to go to Juilliard in, in New York City and study ballet at Juilliard. While I was there during that summer, I got a call from a chorus line on Broadway to come down to that theater and audition for the Broadway show. I was 17, and, uh, and I went down and I auditioned. And this, this time, I had the right song and whatever. The only thing I had wrong was my uh, uncle had taken my eight by 10 picture and it was a color picture of me with a suit and I had a, I had a flower and I was like, you know, it was like prom, you know, it was just all wrong, you know, it was all wrong. But um, uh, I went in and I guess I did pretty well. Um, I didn't get the job from that particular audition, but I left New York that summer and my first week 
in college, I got a call to, to fly to California and join the National Company of A Chorus Line. First week, my parents had just taken me there and put me in my dorm room and took me on a Monday and they came back on a Thursday and put me on a plane, wow. you know. Um, and it was really interesting because the dean, the dean of dance at that time, uh, brought me into his office and he said, you know, Gene, I'm supposed to tell you, you should stay in school and get your education because that's what we do. You know, we, we're here to, to help people find jobs and whatever. He said, but you, you have a job. He said, he said, we can't teach you what you will learn and, and I think you should do it. And that was the beginning of uh, my training in theater. Um, I got a chorus line, I did a chorus line for two years. I left it, I, I was like, let's see, 17, 19, I was 19 when I left the chorus line. Two months after that, I moved to New York, auditioned for Sophisticated Ladies with Mary Grimes. Time you have no, I, I had no representation Are then. You no, 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 no. Wow. Representation doesn't. Uh, representation doesn't totally come until someone deems you worthy of being represented. You know, if someone thinks they can make money off of you. Oh. Okay. So many people in New York, they run in and and and. Um, they run in and think that, you know, they have to have an agent and whatever. What you have to do is get a job. You get the job first and then let someone see you. How do you work out a contract without having representation? What happens is uh, the shows that you do, they have general managers and all of that. Okay. They, they have a, a standard contract deal, you know what I mean? And, and most folks, when they first get their first job, they're in the chorus, you know what I mean? Unless you are a principal, you know? And what I did was I, I started off in the chorus of a chorus line and then I moved to a lead spot. And then I went into sophisticated ladies. Um, Two years later, I, uh, I joined Sophisticated Ladies in Hollywood with Gregory Hines, uh, Phyllis Hyman, Frida Payne, um, a number of talented folks. I was 20, you know. It was, I, I look at it like, in a chorus line, I, I thought, well, hmm. Chorus line was a totally different world than Sophisticated Ladies. One show was all white, the other show was all black. In a chorus line, I was the only black guy, and, and that was that world. And then all of a sudden I jumped into Ebony Magazine. <laughs> I mean, because that's what it was like. It was just classy, you know. And um, there I got to find out what kind of talent I had. I was standing there looking at Gregory Hines on stage and watching him and hitting battle and Greg Burge. And they were the best at what they did. I mean, I get chills just talking about them. And um, I kind of realized that... Uh, in order for me to move to the next level, I would have to decide that I could do what they do as good as they do it, but not try to be them, but be me. All right, so in the process of doing that, I went on one night for Hit and Battle. I understudied Hit and Battle and Greg Burge, and I went on for Hit and Battle. And there was a manager at the theater. Her name is Vicki McCarthy, McCarty. And she called me up out of nowhere, you know. Uh, she saw me on, on stage and, and wanted to represent me. And this was in Hollywood as opposed to New York City. Um, so that's how I, I started with her. And then when I got back to New York, I did a chorus line that took me to Sophisticated Ladies. My next show after Sophisticated Ladies was Tap Dance Kid. I was doing the Tap Dance Kid. I was doing a chorus line. I went back to a chorus line on Broadway. And a manager from, an agent from New York City saw me in that show and decided he wanted to represent me and they represented me for the last 30 years. <laughs> the Gage Group, yeah. I want to be a dancing man while I can. I want to leave my footsteps on the sands of time. If I never leave a dark Be 
feast until the tide rolls in. It's so interesting. Um, I, I've, I've always looked at my career and as I look at it now. I had no idea of, that this was something I wanted to do. I landed, each job followed, the one went right after the next, after the next, after the next. I worked from 18 to 46 before I even knew what unemployment was. Mm. And in an in a industry where they say you have to be unemployed, you know what I mean? You have to wait tables, you have to do this. Um, uh, Luckily, I sang dance and act, you know. Um, when I was off from uh, in between shows, I went and studied acting. And I, I went into the actor's studio and, and did a lot of acting work there. I used to just take, I used to take a lot of classes, you know, and, and uh, it, made, it helped me be well-rounded, you know, so that when you go out for an audition or something, because what happened is, uh, I would start getting auditions for movies and, and different things and uh, doing that, you, you have to kind of be on top of your craft, you know, because if not, you fall in between the cracks. Okay. So what is the difference between preparing for a movie role and doing a part on stage in preparation and preparation. actual performance? Uh, well, interesting enough, uh, it used to be years ago the theater actors were the people that would do the movies eventually because theater actors, they have a training and they're, they're grounded in, in, in truth. Now some theater actors are big they're, and they're too big for the camera, you know, because okay. the cameras are, you need small movements for the camera. Your face doesn't have to do a whole lot. Sometimes in theater you just, ah, you're just very dynamic, you know. Um, the difference is, is, is knowing where you are, how big the house is, you know what I mean? If, if, you're, if you're in a little three, 500 seat house, you don't have to be as big as you have to be in a 2,000 or 3,000 seat house. And on camera, you don't have to be big at all because okay. every little thing is right there, you know? Um, I had the, uh, the one, I, I've done commercials and all that kind of stuff and I've been blessed because uh, one of the commercials I did for it was I think it was uh, United Healthcare, and uh, this guy Michael Apted was the director. Man, this is my first commercial. Michael Apted, uh, he was the director of Gorillas in the Mist, okay. Coal Miner's Daughter. <laughs> you know, oh, okay. I mean, when I landed, I was like, wow, you know, for my first commercial to land with him. And then I had the the gr good fortune of uh, working with Steven Spielberg and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in Catch Me If You Can. It was like uh, my first movie. So uh, outside of, I was a dancer in the Blues Brothers <laughs> back when I was like 20, 21, oh you know. Goodness. And uh, so yeah, I, I, I've had, I've been blessed um, having the chance to work with Stephanie Mills and The Wiz. I was a tin man in The Wiz and uh, in 1992. That was, that was um, a real stretch as an actor, you know. Right. Uh, uh, so. I've been blessed. Sounds like it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as a performer, this is, this is something else. Everybody has a different thing that they do before they perform. It could be nothing. It could be lots of things. Right. Do you have like a pre-performance ritual? And what do you feel before you walk out on stage? Well, I'll tell you. Let's tell you something funny. I used to... When I used to sing in church as a kid, my voice used to quiver. And I, I, I used to sing this song, no man is an island, no man stands alone. And my voice would quiver. And then one day I heard this voice say, you don't have to be nervous, you can sing. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, I never had, I never got really nervous going on stage. For some reason, something just, I get a calm. It's kind of like a zone. You know, I want to be free as any bird can be. Yes, sir. I want to be my footsteps on the sands of time. If I never leave or die, I'm a dancing man with footsteps on For me, what I do before I go on stage, I mean, depending on what kind of uh, performance it is, if it's dancing, 
uh, like this aimless behavior I'm going to be doing in the next couple of weeks here in uh, Huntsville. Um, I usually warm up. Uh, I do like a, 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 a small kind of a ballet bar or just some stretching and then I kind of just center myself, you know, and think about um, where, where I have to be in this show, you know, where, where this show lives. You know, sometimes you have to put yourself in the place that you have to be in before you get there. You can't just walk out. Sometimes you can just walk out and walk into it. You know, when I've, I've done shows, I've been blessed to do shows that run for two years or a year and a half or two years. And when you're doing a show eight times a week and for whatever, you have a different audience every night. So when you walk out there. Um, so is the energy different is what you're the saying? The energy is different. It, I go on how I feel. You know what I mean? Look, I, I, I. I've learned something from working with some of those, uh, I, I guess, kind of star type of folks that really had a hole on the craft that uh, you have to trust yourself. And I think that's in, that's in any, anything you do. Michael Jordan trusted himself playing basketball. At one point, he realized that I can do anything I want when I want to. I can fly, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and he did, you know. Um, so, uh, what I realized is, is that you just kind of have to focus and, and go on, on down the road and trust yourself, trust. I know, Mr. Flipping, you're making this difficult because I can't, it's well, hard when you're not pushing toward something. People always think they have to be aggressive and push toward well, some sort of career goal. Everybody's experience is different, right. you know. Um, Yours is almost like magical, though. My, I, yes, I, 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 I. I have come to understand that my, I've, ha I've had a very nice path and a very, very clear path. I, I don't know many people. I know a few folks, a few of my friends that, that, how many folks have 12 Broadway shows? How many people have one? I mean, right. One, I mean, it's, it's, it's a life. People have built different. teaching yeah. careers oh, yeah. on having one oh, Broadway yeah. show and yeah. doing one yeah. season yeah. of it. And what I've come to figure out is it, it, we're all good at whatever we do. You, you're great at what you do, you know. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't matter, you know. You can. The show that I'm going to do here in Huntsville will be as good as any Broadway show, and it's right here in Huntsville. So I, 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 I like to think that um, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of that show, yeah. it's Ain't Misbehaving, and you, this is not your first experience with that show. Can you tell us about your sort of your life with this show? How many times have you done it? Like, what, two or three? I think I've done Ain't Misbehaving uh, three times. Um, my first time, it was interesting. When my career slowed down with Broadway and stuff, I think in 2000, around 2006 or seven, was the first time I, st I started doing regional theater. I had never done regional theater. I didn't even know what, re you know, right. I started at the top, so all I could do was work my way down. <laughs> you know, I was just heading downhill. But uh, Amos Behaven was one of the, the first shows that I did regionally. I went to um, Chicago, and I did it at the, uh, the Marriott Lincolnshire in Chicago. But now, Chicago is a pretty, that's a... Oh, that's a high theater city. That's a yeah, great a situation town, there. Town. Yeah, and that was my first time doing it. The second time I did it was in Philadelphia. Uh, I did it with Melba Moore. And a uh, few folks, and and um, who was it that I? Clifton Davis came to audition for my part. <laughs> Him and I, so it was pretty funny. But um, yeah, and then I did it a third time, I think, in upstate New York. Yeah, and after that, I realized I didn't want to do it anymore. Because <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. okay. you know, you kind of, um, I don't know. Kind of, when you've done something at a high level, it's kind of hard to do it when it's drifting downhill. When now doing a show that you've done three times, do you find it difficult to revamp it or insert yourself in another situation that's different? Because it's always going to be different. Well, this particular version I'm, I'm enjoying doing because, again, I, I'm coming at it from a different angle. Um, I'm not just a performer, right. you know, okay. um, and I'm, I'm getting to kind of make it, make it fly. I like that. Okay. So I know that this, this production is being done by Independent Musical Productions. Yes. And the performance dates are? The 26th, 27th, and 28th of October, and the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of November. Yes. And for Calhoun students, there's a special dress rehearsal performance with a discounted ticket price 
of $10 and the dress rehearsal is at 6 p.m. and it's at Chan Auditorium on UAH's campus. So um, you all will be able to attend that performance and the others if you if you are so inclined. Um, so we want to have a full house every night. I've been working with them. We're so excited that, that you're in town to do this show uh, for the community. Um, and we're also happy that you don't think we suck. <laughs> 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 no, I wouldn't. Think After that. doing all those great shows, no, no, just, um, no. so the next question I really wanted to ask you, in in sort of to wrap it up, is: Do you have any advice? I know your career kind of, you kind of just rode the wave, but do yeah. you have any advice for young performers? Um, I, I think the one thing I would say is is believe in yourself, believe in yourself, trust. Um, don't think you know it all. Don't don't think that you're the end all, beat all. Okay. You know, um, learn how to learn, learn all parts of your craft of what it is, whatever it is you want to uh, major in or, or whatever your goal is. Um, and I, I think just be be a humble person. Man. Lead 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 with some humility as opposed because a lot of folks, you know. Uh, they do something and, it's, and it becomes all about them. They become grand and whatever, you know. And uh, uh, I've, I've found that uh, the humble and the meek people kind of fly, even though the, the, the other people do too. They rise too, you know. <laughs> so are there any aspects of being an entertaining performer? I know I've mentioned a lot of people that you've worked with and you mentioned a few. Um, are there any things about the entertainment industry that people outside of it who are watching E! News and, mm -hmm. and um, uh, the other media outlets would find interesting about that world. You've lived in LA and New I York. Would. I don't know, I, it, you know, I find it to be, I think, I think when you're young, when you're, when you're young and, and driven by, by hormones and youth and, and all of that, it is the best place to be. Cause you just you know whatever uh after like 25 or 30 years you kind of like slow down and 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 you you wanted to kind of come to you as opposed to you having to run after it right. you know um but as i said it, it it it's fun that's a funny way to put it there's so much of everything there's so much of everything well Mr. Fleming, we are so glad that we had as much of you mm -hmm. as you were willing to give in this 30-minute so interview. This time yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we will say thank you very much for joining us today for our first topics in music discussion. Amen. And um, thank you. We can't wait to see your show. Thank you so Come much. Out all. Yes. All right.